Some people want to find their way to greatness. Some people give up their time and money. Others give up their hobbies and interests. And others take their desire to do well to a whole new level. Some people could even call them psychopaths. History is full of stories about people who want to be great no matter what it takes and who think they have the right to use their power however they want. One of these psychopaths was Ahmad Siraji, the shaman who killed many people. But why? Welcome to another video, and if you're new to the channel, please like and subscribe. If you click the bell icon, you'll know when we add a new video. Let's get started. Suraji was a powerful shaman from a small village in Indonesia called Aman Damai, which ironically means peace and tranquility. His community looked up to him, but he was still driven to kill 42 young women in his quest for greatness. Suraji was born in the middle of Indonesia to a man who called himself a sorcerer. It makes sense that a boy who grew up in a place like this would be interested in black magic. Every day, he saw his father, whose name he didn't even know, get praise and respect for solving problems that affected their community. Suraji, whose real name is Nasib Kalawang, was often ignored by his parents. Because of this, he was known to have been different as a child and had trouble making friends, so he was left alone to his own devices. It wasn't the best thing for him. Suraji was left alone and didn't get much attention, so he didn't do well in school and turned to crime. He went to prison for the first time when he was only 19 years old. He spent 10 years there for small crimes and public violence. Suraji was only free for two years before he went back to jail for stealing cattle. When he got out of jail, he thought he needed to do something to clear his bad name. He didn't like how people looked at him and treated him, so he decided to take after his father. And so began Suraji's journey into sorcery which included helping the people in his community at the time. He became known as Datuk Meringi as time went on. People in the area thought that Suraji could move clouds and heal the sick, but he had a very bad secret. In reality, he was one of the cruelest and most prolific serial killers ever. In 1986, Suraji had a dream that many women and their families later came to fear. He said that his dead father's ghost told him that he had to get the saliva of 70 dead young women to become invisible. Following this dream, he started taking advantage of women who went to him looking for love or help with their marriages. Suraji would sometimes hire sex workers and then kill them because he could not wait for more women to show up. Suraji kept going for 11 years, trying to reach his goal of becoming invincible. He had an efficient way of carrying out his plan. Most of the women who asked for his help did so discreetly, so there was no way to link him to their disappearances. Free money, lots of chances to kill people, a chance to become invisible, and the chance to get away with it all. Suraji was doing well until he met Sri Kamala Dewey, 21, who was to be his final sacrifice, and Andreas, a rickshaw driver whose story saved other women and Aman Damai from a horrible death. On April 27, 1997, a young farmer went to the sugarcane fields to feed his animals. While he was there, he saw a strange pile of dirt. He quickly told Sujito, the leader of the village, about what he'd found. He also lived next door to Suraji. Six men dug there for two hours. There, they found a dead body. The putrid body of a young woman was taken out of the muddy grave. She was naked. People called the police. They thought that she looked like 21-year-old Dewey, so her family was called to identify her body. Arsena, Dewey's mother, said that she could tell it was her daughter just by looking at her legs. No one knew what happened because they hadn't seen Dewey since she left her house three days before to run an errand. Soon after her body was found, a 15-year-old rickshaw driver came forward and told everyone what he knew about how Dewey died. Andreas Suito said that on April 24, 1997, Dewey asked him to take her somewhere, but wouldn't say where. He said that she didn't tell him where she wanted to go until they were halfway there. When I asked her again, she said she wanted to go to Dutuk's house. I was curious because it was late, so I asked her why she was going there. She told me not to be too nosy, he said. When Sujito, the leader of the village, heard Andreas say this, he was shocked. He told Andreas that Suraji had asked about the noise on April 27th. 
and told them not to be afraid if it was a ghost. He also said that Suraji was one of the six people who helped dig Dewey's body out of the ground. Suraji said in his confession that Dewey came to him because she was upset with her fiancé and wanted him back. She asked Suraji for help because she didn't want her fiancé to leave her for another woman. That night, she was scared because on the way to the sugarcane plantation, we had to walk through a cemetery. Even though I said it was fine, she insisted that my wife come with us to the ritual. Dewey asked my wife to come along, which is how she found out about the murders, he said. He said that he had to keep reassuring Dewey to keep her calm while he buried her, and that it only took him 12 to 15 minutes to kill her before sucking out her saliva. Their bodies would break down faster if I buried them without any covering. So with the help of my wife, I took off all her clothes, rolled them up, and put them in a plastic bag. Then I went home, he said, adding that his wife Tumini was with him for the first time. He also said that none of his three wives knew he had killed people until the body of Dewey was found. Suraji was arrested on April 30th, 1997, after the body of Dewey was found and Andreas, the rickshaw driver, said what he knew. He was questioned for four days, and during that time, he freely told the police that he had killed 42 women and buried them all in the same sugarcane field. The military, police, and locals then worked together to find all the other bodies. Dewey's body was still pretty fresh, so it was easy to figure out who she was. Soon after the bodies were found, their families came forward and helped them figure out who they were. There were four bodies that no one could identify. They had to be burned because no one came forward to claim them. The rest were just piles of skulls and bones, so it was impossible to tell who they were. Given how much the bodies had broken down, it was hard to tell if sexual assault had occurred. So Raji assured that none of his murders had ever been about sexual things. He might have been busy with his three wives. Suraji just said that it was also a way for him to make money, because he could rob his victims without getting caught. Several reports of missing people from the villagers later showed that more than 80 women had gone missing. But there was no way to know if Suraji had killed all of them, and the prosecution was having trouble pinning him down, even for the murders that he had openly admitted to. Suraji's trial started on December 11, 1997, with a 363-page charge against him. He insisted that he was innocent. His three wives, who were all sisters, were also arrested because they had helped him kill and hide the bodies. Tumini, one of his wives, was tried with him as a partner. They said they told the police what they did when they tortured them. On April 27, 1998, a group of three judges in Labuk Pakam found Suraji guilty. He was told he would be shot by a firing squad. As the judge read the verdict, many people in the courtroom cheered. More than 100 people were packed into the small courtroom, and the same number watched on a TV screen outside. Suraji's wife, Tumini, was also sentenced to death for helping with the murders, but her sentence was later changed to life in prison. Was there any way that one of his wives could have known he was going to kill all these women and report him? Leave your thoughts in the comment section below. We'll see you at the next one.